Bethlehem Online family. So glad to see you again. We're back. We are back. It's been a couple weeks yep. since we've had him here, but we're glad to have you back. So good to be back. My name's Kyle. If I don't know you, uh, 316 Campus Pastor here. So listen, what do I do here? Nobody really knows. But no one does know, but it's a lot. If you have questions, want to go to lunch, how can I get involved? How can I get connected? Shoot me an email. Would love to follow up with you. Love to hang out with you. Love to meet you. Uh, but that's what we're here for. What do you do here? Yes, he is your guy if you're at 316. I get the opportunity to uh, worship with you each and every week. Yes. I get to pray with you each yep. and every week. And I get to kind of run the social media channels yep. here. So if you are not following us, be sure to follow us. That's the best way to stay connected. Yes. And here at Bethlehem throughout the week. A ton of stuff going on. Best way to stay connected. Mm -hmm. Follow her. She will keep you up to date. A lot of stuff going on around here. There's a here. lot of stuff going on. We Super just exciting, we just celebrated Night to Shine. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. Such a party. <laughs> uh, we've got, what do we got coming up in a couple days? Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. That's right. Yeah. What are you doing for Valentine's Day? I don't know. Dylan's not a planner. I'm not a planner. But Dylan, if you're watching, you better do something good. This is what I know. Been married for almost 20 years. Husbands, when your wives say, hey, don't worry about Valentine's Day. Let's just keep it low key. You better worry about lie. it. <laughs> it's a lie. Do something. Yep. Buy flowers plan a weekend getaway do something don't get caught not doing anything that is the worst mistake you can make so you've been warned there it is husbands <laughs> you have been warned do something for valentine's day right yes. we would love to know what your plans are so let us know in the comments below yep. but if you have never experienced a sunday at bethlehem watch this video and yeah. you can see what you can expect here yeah. each and every week great to see you guys love you Well, good morning. Welcome to Bethlehem Church. It is so good to see you. Let's all stand together. It's time to worship.
rise up in me. So we'll just take your hand, put it on your heart, let's sing this together. Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. You made it here, let's worship everything we got. Let faith
You know, the Bible says that it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. Sometimes I think we can just sing right through a song, read it off a screen, and not pay attention to the words coming out of our mouth. But if you stop for just a minute and think about your life, there are people in this room that have only been saved recently. There are some people who have been saved for a very long time. But you think about the goodness of God in your life. And there's something about declaring the goodness of God when things don't seem good in your life. And to me, that's that step of worship that when you meet God on the other side of that, that is when you experience his kindness is what leads you to repentance. Because some people begin to read those words, sing those words, and go, Phew, I don't know if he's been that good to me, but if you stop and really think, because I'll tell you this, we don't need another reason to sing about the goodness of God other than the fact that he sent his son to die for our sin on the cross and declared it dead. He declared our sin finished, and we don't need another reason. His goodness, he is faithful, he is kind, and he leads us to repentance. Let's sing that again all my life. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good It's every breath that I am making Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God We're going to sing this again and memorize it because I want you to sing it every day this week. No matter what's going on, we're putting some tools in your toolbox for the week. This is, just, this is not just a Sunday performance. We're handing you some weapons. Let's declare it together. All my life, sing it.
Father, we've been singing songs about your goodness all morning long. You are so good to us. And what we're learning is that is the more we focus on your goodness, the, it kind of changes our approach to you, Lord. We're not asking you for things that we think we need. We're just reflecting on what you've already given us. And we are so grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your kindness. We're grateful for forgiveness that comes only through Jesus Christ, through the blood that was shed on the cross. Lord, we thank you for his, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and the way he has changed so many of our lives in this room, and the way we believe it's going to change other lives in this room today. And Father, we're grateful for your mercy, and your grace, and your unconditional love. You just keep loving us. And Father, we thank you for just the peace that we get in your presence. I, I think of the words, Jesus, that you said, that come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So we crawl up in your arms today, and we ask for that rest, which includes peace in there. So, Lord, thank you for being here with us, and we ask you to continue to speak to us, work in our lives, and show us adjustments that need to be made so that, so that we can be a, a clear picture of your son, Jesus. Jesus, we want to be like you, and we love you so much. It's in your name we pray, and everybody said, amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning, everybody. My name's Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here. And I get to say welcome. Man, we are so glad that you came this morning. Whether you're in the room with us or you're watching online, so thrilled that we get to worship together. If you're new here, go ahead and get your phone out and scan the QR code that's on the screen. Uh, that's the easiest way to connect or get plugged in or take a next step here at Bethlehem Church. When you scan that, that QR code, it's going to take you to a form to fill out. At the bottom of that form, there are some check boxes, some different things that are going on here on our campus or here at, here at our church. Check those that you're interested in, and uh, we'll try to get some information to, about those things as quickly as we can. And I'll also let you know that those same, that same connection card is on the website. Or you can also download the Bethlehem Church app. There's a tile there that says connection card, along with a whole lot of other resources. So I want to make sure you're aware of that and get you to, to download that app. It's a great way to stay connected here. Hey, this past Friday night, we got to welcome 650 volunteers and over 200 special needs families from our community. And we had just this unbelievable, truly unforgettable night. Every year, we partner with Tim Tebow Foundation, Night to Shine Prom. And so we transformed this worship center into a huge dance floor. We had a karaoke place in the South Venue. We had nail salons. We had shoe shiners here. We had a red carpet. We had tons of food, tons of people around. It's just the place looked incredible. There's not enough good words to describe it. You just had to see it. And fortunately for you, we happen to have a video here where you can see it. So check it out. It's night to shine. So much fun. 
an unforgettable night, just fun celebrating so many different families in our community. And if I can see it right now, because you have the same thing on your face as I do. We went home that night, our, our faces were sore from smiling. So many smiles that night, just a great, great time. One of the reasons we're able to do things like that is because of you, because of your faithful giving. And we just want to say thank you. It does, it does fuel ministry here, those types of community events we can do. There are four ways to give here at Bethlehem Church. You can see those on the screen. Many have already given online, and we say thank you for that. And just want to invite everybody to be a part of worshiping Jesus that way, where we put, our, we, we put our money where our mouth is, literally, and we say, Jesus, here's my life. I give it all to you. And it does fuel ministry here. Hey, Pastor Jason's ready to come out. You're going to hear a powerful message. And some of you are going to think that that doesn't apply to me, what he's going to say. But I promise you, what I learned is it applies to every single one of us. It's a powerful time. I can't wait for you to hear it. So go ahead and get a copy of God's Word out. You're going to need that. We're going to be in the book of Genesis. And then if you'll open up your app, if you use the app for the notes, or get your note sheet out because you're going to want to take some notes. And let's go to week two of our series called Chasing Peace. So we're glad you're with us. Thanks for worshiping across our campuses, our online family, uh, our friends in St. Croix. You are not enjoying the cold and rain as we are. You're enjoying the sunshine. And so we're envious of you, but we're glad you're with us. If you're in South Venue as well, uh, we're thankful for you. Chasing Peace is the series that we've been in. And I teach in series. I try to take my time through a text, through a story in scripture, uh, and let maybe God speak to us. I think he's got something for you today. But what is Chasing Peace? It's about life in the gap. What do you mean gap? Let me give you a refresher. Uh, get, the gap is where many people experience life. What I thought my life would be, what my plans were for this season, well, what I thought I'd be doing for my career, what my dream I thought God had placed in my heart, where my talent I thought it would take me, what I thought life would be, and actually what life is. And oftentimes there's a gap, and in that gap is where we chase peace. And at the bottom, where we're, where we're kind of spending our time is how would your outlook on life, here's the question we're asking for the series, how would your outlook on life change, because we think peace is at the bottom of this, how would your outlook on life change if you actually believed God was with you in every situation? Like we've given up on perfect. All of us have. What do you mean by perfect? Like it's just going to be perfect. Perfect mate, right? Perfect uh, path, perfect career path, perfect job. Life's not perfect, but what we do want is peace. That sense, that innate peace, peace of mind, peace of soul, peace in our hearts, just that <sighs> peace. That's what we desire, and we think at the bottom of this question, how life would change if you actually believed God. Not cheap cliche, oh yeah, God's with you. Not coffee mug, God is with you. Not bumper sticker theology, God is with you. Not just Christmas Emmanuel, God's with you. But you actually believed in every situation, whether you're there by your own making or life happened, God is actually with you in every situation. The presence of God. He is not in the future waiting on you for you, for you to catch up with him. Nor is he in the past with his arms crossed going, well, you made those decisions, you're on your own. The power of the gospel is I am with you to the end of the age, and God is with us. Where my feet are planted, if you were here last week, my God is, two of you were good, my God is present. <laughs> so good. Blesses my heart as a pastor, you remember what, thank you. Golly, <laughs> Lord help us. Where my feet are planted. My God is present. Genesis 37, if you got your Bibles, want to keep on up in this um, series. We're using the story of Joseph as a springboard in the Old Testament because Joseph was a guy who experienced life in the gap. Now, I told you last week, Genesis 
that it's a story, Joseph's story, I should say, is a story of family dysfunction. And, and I don't, don't need to raise hands who's with me on family dysfunction, but I want to get you a sense of the dysfunction in Joseph's life. Jacob was Joseph's father. Jacob, you can read his backstory up to Genesis, up to this point. Jacob had four wives. If you're keeping count, that's three too many, okay? <laughs> he had 13 kids with four different women, 12 sons and one daughter. Jacob was a bit of a swindler. He was a cheat, if you know the backstory. Not because he didn't have a relationship with God. He did, but he was a complicated dude. He was a guy who was twisted, right? He was a guy who kind of looked out for himself, but in fact, God still used him for his glory. And so there was a dysfunctional family kind of lineage that you have. And I want you to see the dynamics in the family so you can see I'm not making it up. In fact, Genesis 37, here's what it says. Joseph, who's kind of the character we're jumping off of in this series, being 17 years old, the youngest, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. They're tending sheep. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So let me translate. Here's what the Bible's saying. Joseph was a snotty-nosed little tattletale. <laughs> Make sure you're tracking with me. That's what the Bible just said. Let's keep reading. Now Israel, that is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made a robe for him of many colors. So Joseph says, my brothers are being idiots out in the field. And his dad says, I know what, I'm going to give you a coat just to say thanks. Now make sure that you're on the same page with me. Not like a Costco on the table, overstock, cheap coats. No, I'm talking about Gucci, Prada, designer stuff here. For some of you outdoor fake, you know, wannabe people, your Patagonian, your North Face stuff. That's what's going on. He gives it to him. Now this is not a parenting talk, but I can say this to you. If your youngest comes and tells on your oldest and you give them a coat, that's between you and God. It's going to be real complicated for you, right? Not a parenting talk. And so you see this and his brothers, look at what it says. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So you got a father who was dysfunctional, made some dumb choices, created kind of a crazy environment. You got brothers who were envious, but he followed the story on down. Joseph has two dreams, dreams God actually placed in his heart about his future. He didn't know what was going on. And Joseph's interpretation of these dreams, being 17-year-old and selfish and ambitious, he basically tells his brothers, I had a dream, and God showed me that one day I'm going to rule over you. So that didn't go well either. Keep reading Genesis 37, <laughs> right? That didn't read well either. And so his brothers responded about the way you would respond, and here's what the Bible says. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And so from here on is where you'll begin to see the life Joseph had planned, the life Joseph he felt God called him to, his destiny, and the gap between that, what life actually was. From this point on, Joseph's brothers betray him, and for the next 20 years of his life, he lives life in the gap. Between what God put in his heart, between his giftedness and his talent, and what life actually was. And here's my question this morning real quickly. Who's to blame? Isn't that the question we ask when we look up and go, this isn't my plan for this time of my life. I thought by this time I'd be able to retire. I thought by this time I'd have a girlfriend. I thought by this time I'd be married. I thought I'd still be married. I thought this would be what I was doing because I've worked so hard. When we're not where we want to be in life, the question we oftentimes ask is, who is to blame? Was it Joseph's father, Jacob, and the jacked up family dysfunction that he created? Yes. Was it Joseph's envious brothers and they hated him? Was that who was to blame? Yes. Was it Joseph, his selfish ambition as a 17-year-old? Yes. Church, catch this. The Bible is not a record of the blessed good. The Bible is a record of the blessed bad. And that should free you up. When you think the Bible as a story about God who finds really cool people that does ridiculously cool things for God, you're missing the point. In fact, this morning, here's what I want you to see. The Bible is about a perfect God who loves messed up people in messy situations and chooses to use their story for his glory. 
That's the best news possible. That's what scripture is. That's the heart of the gospel, that the Bible is about a perfect God who loves messed up people in messy situations and uses their story for his glory. So when we find ourselves in a season, in a place of life we really didn't plan on, the question we ask is why? Why are we here? Why is this happening? Why did I end up here? And I want everybody to lean in real quick. Here's the cold hard facts. Most of the time when you find yourself in a place in life you didn't plan on being or this season of life or this picture that you had for your job that didn't work out the way you thought to. Why, why, why? Here are the cold hard facts. Most of the time there's multiple reasons. And we want to point at one. Some of it's because of our own choices and some of it because of things that are out of our control. Why God is not a sinful question. Why God's a question all of you have thought, I've thought. Why God's not even a wrong question. But I would argue if God is with us and he's with messed up people in messed up situations, I don't think why God is a wrong question. I don't think it's a sinful question, but I would contend to you this morning, sometimes it's not the most helpful question. Because why God, there's multiple reasons if we get to the bottom of it. What are you saying? If you're taking notes, here's what I would say. What now, God, sometimes is a way more helpful question than why me, God? What now? If God is with us in every situation, the one that we, the dreams that we have, the plans that we have, the life that we want, maybe God puts it in there. Maybe he gifts us. I, I believe he does. But sometimes we don't experience that. We go, why? Why am I here? Why didn't this work out? Why is it this? Sometimes what now? What do you want to do now? What now, God? And so for a moment, there's an inner struggle that I think accompanies this season of life. If you've ever found your life in the gap, here's where I thought I was going to go, here's what I thought was going to happen, and here's what happened. I think there's an inner struggle we never put words to. In fact, in 11 years pastoring here, I've never walked down this road. Most of you have never heard a talk on what I want to press in on, but I think it's true for every one of us. In fact, here's what James says. It's the inner struggle. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists. Pause. Is that not true in Joseph's story? His brothers were jealous. Joseph had selfish ambition. Where that exists, there will be disorder. What is disorder? The opposite of peace. And every vile practice. Proverbs says this. A tranquil heart. What does tranquil mean in the room, somebody? Ooh, you guys are good. Don't let anybody fool you. Cold and rainy, this group's still alive, okay? <laughs> a tranquil heart, a peaceful heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. If they're in studying for this text, if there's a sin that no one talks about, in fact, no one talks about it, no one admits to it. When we're in a season of life where we're experiencing things we didn't plan on, in almost every case, when we're disappointed, and dissatisfied. Listen to me, lean in. Envy and jealousy arises in our heart and most of us are unaware of it. Envy and je When we experience life in the gap, or cha oh, oftentimes we experience envy and jealousy. Here's what I would contend. It is what everyone wrestles with and no one will admit to. It's what everyone around, men, I want you to listen to me. Dudes in the room, I'm talking to you. And you ladies, teenagers, every person. It's what everybody wrestles with, but no one will admit. See, envy and jealousy, you can use those words interchangeably in the scripture and in life. In fact, they define each other. If I were to differentiate, envy is wanting what others have, wanting the position or recognition others have. Jealousy is what we feel towards them, the animosity and resentment we feel towards them because they have what we don't. And so I want to talk for just a moment about something that you're going to argue with me in your head about. While we talk, you're going to say, he's not talking to me. Because nobody ever admits they struggle with envy and jealousy. And I'm telling you by the end of this talk, and in just a few moments, we're all going to see that we all wrestle with it on some level. What do you mean? Write this down. Envy is less visible and makes you more miserable. Jason's rhyming this morning. Yeah, he is. 
Here's why we wrestle with envy and we don't realize it. Envy is a thing that's easy to fall into, and here's why. Because it plays into our insecurities. And we all, no matter what age we are, 15 or 55, we wrestle with insecurities. Especially when we're experiencing life in the gap between what we hoped life would be, where we thought we would be, what we thought our bank account would say, what we thought the position we'd have would be, and what it is. Oftentimes when things don't go the way we plan, you know what we feel? Insecure. Envy preys on insecurity. Envy is wanting somebody else's life, somebody else's uh, position, somebody else's recognition, and I want you to lean in. And who would ever admit to that? Oh, that's me. <laughs> no, because it makes us feel, it makes us seem small. And it's about wanting somebody, you see in somebody else's marriage, seeing somebody else's romance, somebody else's body, somebody else's lifestyle. Right? It's less visible. What do you mean? There's some sin struggles we have that we see the effects of it, and so there's something that prompts in us to deal with it. Like there's some things, like if you're a person who gets angry, nobody pointing or anything, you pop off. You get loud in your family. You see the collateral damage of that, and there's something in you that's like, dude, I can't do that. I got to get that fixed. Or maybe you struggle with an addiction and you see not only the effects in your life, but you see it in the other people around you and it prompts you, what? I got to get some things in line. I need some help. It's visible. Or maybe lust. For some of us, we str- again, we don't talk about it out loud, but we struggle with lust in our heart. But you know what follows lust when we give in? Shame. Right away. Not so much with envy. It hides and it lurks. We don't see an immediate effect. It hides and it lurks. Think of it this way. I'm not a doctor. You guys know that. I'm not a medical doctor. But when I go to the urgent care over here or when I go see my doc, anytime I get diagnosed or with something, almost every time it ends with this. Itis. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Nurses in the room, everything's got an itis to it. You know what I mean? You got bronchitis. You got laryngitis. You with me? You got tendonitis. And some of you that were really happy during the middle of the week when it was 70 and now it's 30 and cold, you got sinusitis. You're with me. You're tracking sinusitis. Can I tell you what we all have in our society? Our society struggles with a big old case of comparisonitis. Like in a social media visual world where all of us live visual lives, everything is stimulating. I don't think we realize how much, whether up close, somebody who works with us, our neighbors, or whether it's at a distance, all the time we're looking out over the fence of our life at somebody else's. Somebody else's student, somebody else's body. Lady, somebody else's body. You know how much society's built on that? You looking, wanting that? Somebody else's stuff, somebody else's romance, somebody else's happiness, somebody else's satisfaction, somebody else's success. And all the time when we're looking out, whether it be somebody close to us or from a distance on a screen, we don't realize the same time we're wrestling inside with why don't we have, why don't, that's called envy. Like the plague of suburban America, and I've pastored in suburban America for some time, the plague, the subtle sickness that is suburban America is comparison, is envy. Many of us have made the dumbest financial decisions of our life based on nothing but envy. Envy. Right? We just go, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Now, you said it's less visible, but it makes you more miserable. What do you mean by that? Because it runs deep. It moves in from wanting what others have to resenting them for having it and you not. But who would ever admit that? Envy is being unhappy at others' happiness. Envy is resenting others' success. Right? See, resenting others. Romans 12, we talked about it. The Bible says love, Pastor Matt finished up Romans 12. He says love weeps with those who weeps and rejoices with those who rejoice. But sometimes it's easier to weep with those who weep than it is to rejoice with those who rejoice, especially when we're not rejoicing. Let me say it again because I said it real fast and I did that on purpose. Sometimes it's easier to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn than it is to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, especially when we're in a place in our life we're not rejoicing. Why is that? Envy. 
Envy. You know, the test of envy, and again, nobody would ever admit this, but the test of envy in our own personal lives is when somebody who has more, somebody who has more success, somebody who has a position better than us, somebody who has more, th- when they fail, we actually like it. When they fall down, you know what we think? They had it coming. What is that called? Envy. But we never talk about it because it seems small and petty. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Envy sucks. <laughs> Out any joy and peace in life that is present. That was a good pause there, right? Envy sucks out any joy and life that's present. It poisons your ability. Did he say that? And we danced on Friday night too. We're crazy around here, okay? <laughs> Listen, it poisons your ability to enjoy the goodness of God in your life. Envy, like more people struggle from lack of peace, not because their situation is not what they want, but because they're eating up with envy and they just won't call it out. It steals it, right? Yeah, how do you know? Like, how do you know you're in the grip of envy? Across our campuses, watching all like, how do you know you're in the grip of envy? Nothing is ever good enough. No, I don't know, Jason. No, I'm telling you, at the root of that is envy, and we never see it. Nothing's ever good enough. What do you, your job isn't good enough. You're never in good enough shape. Your body's not ever good enough. You never have enough money. You're, listen to me, young couples. The idea of I'm going to live, I'm going to have the life my family, my parents have now. Why is that? Well, that's just the way of the world. No, it's called envy. We want what's not ours and we want it now. Right? Your husband can never do enough. Your friendships are never enough. Here, here's envy. You got the best job ever. But your girlfriend, she gets two weeks of vacation. That's not fair. What is that? Envy. You just won the lottery, man. You got the Powerball, the 700 million. You just won the lottery. I didn't think we could talk about the church. You can't. But still, let's say you did. Right? You just won that. And you know what you're mad about? How much taxes you got taken out. (laughs) That's envy. Never is never. Nothing is ever good enough. Oh, Jason, uh, fight with me in your head. Here's what, if I'm, if I'm you sitting here saying, here's how I'd be fine. Well, I'm just a driven person. I'm just success oriented. I want to give my best to God. I'm just ambitious. Good. So am I. You guys have been, I'm moved. I'm going. I'm with you. But I'm also have lived life long enough that sometimes we call ambition and drivenness is code words for envy. It's code words. Don't take it from Jason. What? Solomon, the Elon Musk of his time, the Jeff Bezos of his time. In fact, the most wealthy man still to this day in the time that he lived was Solomon. Here's what he said. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work, all hard work, all toil and skill and work, here it is, come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is a vanity and striving after the wind. Here's what Solomon said. At the... If I pushed it all away, success, and I hope you are, ambitious, driven, successful, all of that, but up under it sometimes is nothing more than envy. I didn't say it. Solomon did. Here's the way it works. Got a vacuum cleaner on stage. Anybody got vacuum? Y'all got a vacuum in your house? Listen, some of you are fancy. You got your motorized, your robotic vacuum. It does it itself. Any Roomba people in the room, you got it. Be honest. Raise your hand. Grandma, I know you do right here. It's my kid's grandmother, okay? And so I know she does, right? Somebody's like, you call her grandma. It's my grandma, okay? My kid's grandma. Now listen, listen right here. Some of you fancy Roomba people were envious of you, okay? But the rest of us who are old school, what do we got? This bad boy right here. Now, here's the way this works. It's a, it creates a vortex, okay, that sucks anything you want, anything you don't want on your floor up. Now, my kids, they're in here. They will do dishes. They will take out the trash, but they fight over who's going to vacuum. They just hate it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's like a race. But here's the deal. It sucks up anything you don't want on the floor. It creates a vortex and takes it out. All right? Dog hair. 
gone. Cat hair, if you got a cat, gone. Or take that whole cat in here, you know? <laughs> right? Get that thing and get it out of here. Gone. Gone. C crumbs, food, trash. Do it a couple of times a week. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, man, your house is a mess. Do it a couple of times a week. But it creates a vortex and it sucks up everything you don't want on the floor. Lean in for a second, church. The way envy functions in your life is it creates a vortex and sucks everything you do want in your life out of it. What you do want is to experience contentment. What you do want is to experience joy. What you do want is to experience peace. And what I'm telling you is envy creates a vortex and it takes all that because you're always looking over the fence saying nothing's ever good enough. Nothing's ever good enough. It's never good enough. It's never enough. What is that? Envy. See, I think it's possible to experience peace in this life. Even when you're not where you planned on being or want to be. Why? Because Jesus says, I give you peace, John 14, and it's not peace that's of this world. The peace of this world is everything going to plan. Anybody experience that? No. But I still think there's peace that you can experience because of the presence of God. But if envy is a part of your life, it takes everything that's good, even when you're not in the best spot, and it sucks it out of there. Why? Because it's always looking at what you could have. Church, when I am fixated, when we are fixated on what you don't have, you miss all the blessings that you do. You miss all the good that you do. And here's the third thing. Envy's assumption is that it's about what others have and I lack when it's actually about God. The assumption of envy, again, none of us deal with it, but if you did, this is about what others have that we lack when it's actually about God. Here's the, misdirect Here's the angst and the frustration. Here's the misdirection of envy. It's about the opportunity somebody else got, but you didn't. It's about the breaks he got, but you hadn't got. It's about the life she's gotten to live that you haven't. It's about the romance that she's experienced that you never will. It's about the stuff they have that we don't. And again, we never come out and say it because it makes us feel petty and small. So who comes out and says that? But let's face it. In a moment of clarity, if you believe that God is sovereign, which means he's controlled from beginning to end, right? If you believe we have a heavenly father who loves and cares for us, who believes that? Heavenly father, yeah, all of us loves and cares for us, that our God is both provider and sustainer. Here's what that means. There's nothing he cannot do. Here's what that means. If you believe all those things to be true about God, here it is. He could have fixed all this for you, and he hasn't. What God did for one, he could do for you, but for some reason he didn't. Your but, your problem isn't with what they have, the breaks they've got, the life they're living, the opportunities they got. Your problem isn't with the other person. Here it is. Your problem's actually with God. You think your creator owes you. Now, here's the thing. None of us would ever say that. None of us would ever come out and say, God owes us. That sounds absurd and childish. And so that's the power of envy. Envy stays in our mind thinking it's between us and somebody else and the chances they've got and the opportunities they've got and the breaks they've got and the things I haven't got. And all along, it's between you and God. That's the power of envy. No one would ever come out and say it. You think it's about how life's treated them and not you. Ultimately, it's about you and your creator. And nobody would ever say that. Now, I never, ever, ever preach something I haven't wrestled with in my own life. Like, I don't, I don't, I think sometimes you guys, because these screens mess with us, because the guys on screen, it's like, somehow I haven't ever done, no, 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 I, I've wrestled with this. In fact, before I came to be the pastor here, I served at another church. I mean, if you know that I told you last week I'd come out of a tough season in ministry where we felt like God placed something in our heart, a dream, but it never really took off, failed, 
struggled at something? Anybody ever done that? Failed, struggled at something? Again, probably just me. Y'all got to get it figured out. But I had just come through a season of life where that had happened. And my friend, Kevin Queen, many of you know that name. Kevin was serving at a church in Gwinnett. And Kevin, uh, he and I have been friends since high school. Really younger than that. Grew up together. Uh, and Kevin and I, and, and, and so he recommended me for a job to serve at the church he was serving at. And I got the job. And my wife was pregnant with uh, Carson, our first son. It was an opportunity we had, and we just jumped at it. It was around great people in a great setting, still to this day, some of the best years of my life. And I started there, my friend Kevin Quinn grew up with. And here was the thing Kevin wasn't the senior pastor. He is now in Nashville, Tennessee, but he wasn't the senior pastor. But God's hand was on him. Kevin's an anointed teacher. He's a gifted teacher. God's given him gifts and anointing and blessing, and God's hand was on him. And he was getting opportunity after opportunity to use the gifts God had given him. And everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. You ever been around somebody like that? Everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. Guess who wasn't getting to use the gifts God had given him in that season of his life? Guess who wasn't getting the opportunities his friend Kevin was? Guess who whatever he touched didn't seem to be turning to gold? And guess what he wrestled with? And it was weird because it was my friend, so you can't come out and say anything. Because it makes you, smell, it makes you feel small and petty. And I struggle with this thing called envy. Not once, but for 18 months while we served at this church, guess what I struggled with? I felt like I was chasing peace. I felt like I was chasing peace. And my wife, we talked about it, told her this story earlier this week, and she goes, she was pregnant with Claire at this point, or maybe Carson, one of them, one of them, they're great. And so... Uh, <laughs> They're great. One of them. She was pregnant. She would listen to me. We'd walk around the neighborhood. We lived in Buford. We walked around the neighborhood, and she would listen to me, and she knew this was ultimately something God had to do in me because I would talk about opportunities and breaks and chances and how I didn't get that. And da, 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 da. I remember laying in bed one night, and just like the Spirit of God does sometimes, you listen, listen, right here, just like the Spirit of God does, I remember God just kind of whispering, you think this is between you and somebody else. This is about you and me, Jason. This is about you and me. Envy and jealousy is not about the breaks other people's gotten. It's between you and God. Now, here's the crazy thing. I'm talking to Kevin, my buddy, on Tuesday. Anytime he'll, I tell a story where maybe he's involved or he tells a story I'm involved, we've learned to give each other a heads up because y'all have an amazing way of hearing something we didn't say. <laughs> People that listen to messages go, Jason said, I never said that, but you say I did. So we always give each other the heads up. I call Kevin, and we're talking on Tuesday afternoon. And so he goes, Jason, let me, let me flip that on you because there's another part of the story. We already we talked about this in the past. He goes, let me flip that on you. There's another start part of the story I've never told you. It's Tuesday afternoon. He goes, I remember when my buddy Jason Britt got called to be a senior pastor 11 years ago. And here's what I thought. I never got a chance to be a senior pastor. And, and I remember when I started hearing that he was getting to preach every week and I started hearing stories out of this place called Bethlehem Church about what God was doing and I wanted to celebrate but I also thought why haven't I got that opportunity yet? Why haven't I got that chance yet? But I would never come out and say it because to come out and say it would make you feel small and you should be celebrating for your friends but actually all you're feeling is envy and jealousy. Listen to me. Everybody's locked in and here's why. Envy is what every last one of us have dealt with and nobody admits to. And that's his power. It's what everyone wrestles with and no one admits to. So as we close, I want to give you the break the power of envy because it's really simple. The power in this room this morning, we brought it to the light. Because again, 11 years, I've never talked about, I've used the word jealous but to jump into a talk on envy and jealousy, most of you have never heard a talk on envy and jealousy. Why? It's the sin that lurks beneath the surface and it gobbles up our life. Here's the power. I want you to write this down and we're done. Confession breaks the power of envy and builds the presence of peace in your life. 
Confession is what breaks the power of envy and builds the presence of peace in your life. Church, envy lurks and hides in the dark. In the deep recesses of our mind and our soul is where it lives. Envy plays on our insecurities. Envy has power in the dark. What do you mean in the dark? When we act like we've never struggled with envy, when we act like we've never resented anybody, when we act like we've never had animosity towards somebody, when we go, oh, it's never been me, when they got that opportunity, when they got that chance, when they got that break, I've never had that problem. When we act like we've never dealt with, it has power. It has power. It rots our soul. Envy wants you to ignore it and excuse it as that's just the modern way America is. Church, it corrodes our soul. It steals our peace and it brings havoc in our lives and we don't even know it. In the English language, confession is admitting or acknowledging, but biblically, listen to me, in the scriptures, confession is the first step that unleashes change because it breaks the power. My wife's reading a book by a guy named Jamie Winship called Fearless. He talks about confession, and in the book, here's what he said. Confession is truth-telling. Confession is you actually telling the truth about you. God doesn't deal in the dark. God doesn't deal in your unself-awareness. God deals when you see yourself and call it out. God deals in the truth. Confession is what is true. Confession is not just going, oh, yeah, yeah, I've dealt with envy. Oh, yeah, I've been jealous. No, church. Confession is when we go, this is in my life. This has shown up. I'm embarrassed by it. I don't like it, but it's been there. And I'm confessing it because I don't want it anymore, but I don't have the power to change it. But God, you do. Envy has no end. Jealousy has no end. Like there's no end to it. There's no gratification in it. It's just going to continue in our mind, in our souls, like a vortex in the peace, in the joy, in the life we could have. We're always going, nothing's ever good enough. Never got that chance. Never got that break. That's the power of envy. Confession, though, has an end. What do you mean? When you confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sin and unrighteousness. Here's the end of confession. Here it is. When we confess, confession has an end. You know what it's called? Grace. A grace not only to forgive us, but a grace to sustain us. The God of peace that transcends understanding guards our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4. What does that mean? That there's a God who gives us peace even when we're not in the place in life we wanted. That's what it calls transcends. Transcends understanding. What makes sense is I should be mad. What makes sense is I should be angry. What makes sense is I should want somebody else's life. But for whatever reason, I've got a peace. Where does that come from? Jesus Christ. So I want you to stand with me around the room. We're going to close our time. And as you stand, I want you to clasp your hands like you're about to pray. Just kind of do this. Fold your hands like this. If you're new with us, don't, don't get freaked out here. I'm not going to, not going to be crazy. I just want you to, we're going to do a practice thing here. I just want us to see the power of confession. So across this room, just kind of clasp our hands like this. See, the Bible says fear and thanksgiving can't reside in the same heart. I say that oftentimes here. The emotion of fear and gratitude, they can't exist. You're either grateful or you're fearful. I would argue envy and peace can't reside in the same heart. You're either envious or you can experience peace. But if you're envious, you will not experience peace. And if you don't call it out. So what I want to do with our head bowed and eyes closed, it's between you and God. Those times in life, right now, the gifts that person has, the opportunity your neighbor's been given, that your brother's gotten, just between you and God, I want you the resent what we're holding in our hand, what we're clasping here. I just want is the resentment. Just call it out. Right where you're at. God, I can say it. They've had opportunities I've never gotten. I don't like where I'm at, and, and I and I hate to admit this, but at times I've been unhappy with their happiness. Just say it to him. He knows all you're doing now is speaking the truth. 
This is, like, like it's been in my life. All of, if you are standing this, in this room, what I am saying is this, you are confessing to envy. Well, I didn't agree to that. Well, I disagreed for you. We're all envious. We all struggle with it. So when we see it, we call it out. Here's what, just, what it is. Toward a person, what you want that you don't have, what you think you deserve that you had not got, it's all envy. It's jealousy. Just call it out. I know it. It's in my life. It's in my mind. We would never say it out loud. But when we speak it, what we're doing is saying, God, I confess this. I confess it. And here's what I want you to do. I'm just going to trust you. I ain't going to trust you. Where I'm at in life right now, doesn't matter how I got here, I just got to choose to trust you. Envy and jealousy robs me of what I want. And so I just want you to say right now, across this room, just say, I trust you. I trust you. And just release that hands. That is what the power of confession is. When we hold it, own it, and give it to God. With your head bowed and eyes closed in a few moments, prayer teams will be down here. Religion cannot cure you of jealousy and envy. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit can. Maybe you've never stepped out and followed him. You don't have peace because you've never stepped out and followed Jesus. And maybe you would just go, Jesus, I, I'm choosing the best I know how. But you died and you rose again. I, I, believe, I know I can't save myself and I'm going to trust you. Forgive me of my sins. Maybe right where you're at, in a few moments, prayer teams will be down here. I'll be in the living room. We would love to celebrate, pray with you. Just right where you're at. For others of us in this room, we're going to do the opposite as we close of envy. Envy is wanting. Praising is thanking. Envy is wanting what others have. Praising is thanking. When we choose to praise what we are thanking God for who he is and where we're at. So Joel, over this room this morning, we're going to end doing the opposite of envy, which is confess and praise. All the earth, song you guys know, it's us lifting our voice, not looking out, wanting what others have, but being thankful for who God is in our life. Nobody leaving as we close. This is our declaration as we pray this. Joel, lead it over us. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. thankful for what we have. We are thankful for where we are. We got envy and jealousy when we're in a season of life we didn't plan on. Oftentimes rears its head. And I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, you've broken the power of it, that we see it. Church, confession is not something we do once. Confession is something we do over and over and over again and we receive that. So if we can pray for you, God, in the name of Jesus, I pray blessings over my friends and family. God, for this morning, we say, yes, Jesus. And all God's people said? So down front, man, if we could pray over you, pray with you, we would love to. Made a decision, or are there something going on in your life we can pray peace for? 
It would be our honor. If I hadn't met you, I'll be in the living room. Love to talk to you there. Be blessed, be free, and have a great week. I know you want to shut it off, but don't leave us yet. We would love to pray for you. Just as we're doing right here at 316, our prayer teams are coming up, but we would love to know. So either drop your request in the comments or head to our prayer wall on our website and our staff and our people of this church are praying for you. And you also get the opportunity to pray for other people. So what a cool thing. Let us know how we can pray for you throughout the week. Absolutely. And listen to it. We want to give the opportunity. If you've got questions about, you know, what does it look like to have a relationship with Christ? Um, maybe you've heard us talk about baptism before and you just got questions, want to talk with someone, man, just text the word in Christ to 97,000. Uh, we'll have someone follow up with you, have that conversation. Uh, even if it's just beginning a conversation, we would love to do that with you. Uh, we'd love to pray for you. Uh, but be sure and do that. Uh, man, it's such an important thing. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation uh, with you. But as always, so glad that you were here with us, worshiping with us. I've, I've so loved this uh, series, Chasing Peace. So Cannot good. wait to see what God's going to do through it. But until next time, we love you guys. Have a great day.